Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Alexander this morning is home with an, an ill child, and so we'll keep young people in here. You got a bear, and um, if you if you have a young person border uh, border age there that uh, could benefit from the nursery, uh, feel free to uh, take them uh, down there, and then we're more than staffed and ready to handle them. We're in John chapter nine. John chapter nine here this morning. John chapter nine. Does anybody need to go down there? Does anybody need to go down to the nursery area? <laughs> we could have a staff or uh, usher direct if we need if we need help uh, taking anybody down there. We're continuing in our study here on the I Am's, the I Am's of the Bible. And uh, we pick it up in uh, John chapter 9, and uh, we see here uh, from our passage, Jesus, where he says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 9, and uh, we're going to start reading in verse number 1, but each of us were born with a debilitating condition of spiritual blindness. Did you get that? We were all born spiritually blind. There's anybody that was born saved. There's nobody that was born a Christian. And uh, you don't just, uh, because maybe you were born into a family that went to church, doesn't mean that uh, you are a Christian. Uh, there needs to be a willing decision where we come to understand our sin condition, that we need Christ as Savior, and then we willingly need to receive Him as our Savior. And that's when we get born into God's family. That's when we become a Christian. And so regardless of our desire to see spiritually, we were blind uh, to the ways of God. Our only hope was for a miraculous light, and thankfully Jesus is that light of the world. Jesus is that light of the world. Can I direct your attention to John 9, beginning in verse number 1? The Bible says this, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that hath sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Jesus spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which, by, which is by interpretation sent. So this pool of Siloam, where Jesus told him to go wash in, it's called sent. Kind of an odd name for a, a, uh, a uh, pool. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Let's pray. Father, I need you this morning. I need you every Second of every minute of every hour of every day, God, and now is no exception. Lord, we all need you. You are our bread. We learn the bread of life. And this morning we see that you are the light of the world. Lord, we need you. Uh, we need your uh, filling. We need your indwelling to receive uh, from your word. Lord, would you illuminate your words uh, to our hearts? And uh, may we be further along as as a result of having met this morning, Lord, would you fill me and help me? Empty me of self and sin, Lord, and uh, speak to the hearts of your people from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> 
As a boy, there was a man, a poet, his name was Robert Louis Stevenson. He was intrigued by the work of the old lamplighter who went about with a ladder and a torch and setting the street lights ablaze for the night. One evening in Edinburgh, Scotland, a young Robert stood watching with childish fascination. His parents heard him exclaim, Look, look, there is a man out there punching holes in the darkness. I've got an assortment of different lights up here, and I can't wait to turn them on. This is my uh, one of my newer ones. I got this for Christmas, and and I was looking for a, a spot. I was looking for a light that was super powerful, and and uh, you can tell it's super powerful right here. This is a five thousand lumen light. I wanted a light that I could uh, take and shine from my house to the back of my yard uh, for. Uh, Actually, for coyotes, for anything, who doesn't want a cool light, right? But um, our neighbor had a sad story. Her sweet neighbor, a lady, and uh, her husband, her family, they had little, little tiny dog, I forget the kind, little ankle biter dog. But uh, one night they had let the dog out about 10 o'clock, they said. And um, he let him out to relieve itself, and then dog never came back. And uh, we believe that it was coyotes. We got coyotes in the back there and, and stuff. But I wanted a light that I could shine and spot coyotes in the backyard. And I got this one. This is 5,000 lumens, 5,000 lumens. Pretty, pretty good. I know there are more powerful ones out there, but it's super solid. And, and it'll light that backyard up there, and it even can zoom in quite a bit. I won't, I'm going to be careful not to shine it and blind you all, but... But uh, it, it literally will punch holes in the darkness at the back of our yard. And uh, that's what Robert Louis Stevenson said. As we uh, continue to examine the I Am statements of Jesus, we come to his proclamation of being the light of the world. Like the man setting the street lights ablaze, Jesus came to punch an eternal hole in the darkness of this world. And by the way, a couple of thoughts concerning the light. Number one concerning light, the, uh, the, uh, the world is in darkness. The world is in darkness. This world that you were born into, it's a, it's a world of spiritual darkness. The Bible says that uh, the devil, Satan, is the prince and power of the air. For whatever reason, God has allowed uh, Satan to be down here uh, being the, the little G-O-D, God of this world. And he's a God of darkness. Um, another thing concerning light, the light is come into the world. The light is come into the world. The light is Jesus. Jesus has come into this world to expose the darkness and to reveal light. Number next, the light condemns or saves. The light condemns or saves. A person needs to know their sin condition before they understand that they need to be saved from it. And so the light condemns, it, it spots on the sin but then it also reveals the condition so that a person can be saved. Does that make sense? Without the light, without the Word of God, we wouldn't know that we are sinners. But the Word of God reveals to us that we are sinners. Number next, the light eliminates the darkness. The light eliminates the darkness. When the light of God, when the light of the Word of God is shined upon that, it'll eliminate that darkness. That's why some people don't like the light. Because it reveals or it exposes their condition. It's like looking into a mirror. The Bible uses an illustration of mirror as well. And, and uh, you can, you know, every morning I get up and one of the first things will be in the bathroom and I look in the mirror there. And there's going to be some adjustments that need to be, me, uh, need to be made. I've got, you know, often eye boogers and, uh, and uh, some of you got slobber when you wake up drool on your face and and uh, we it reveals the problem that we have and we need to fix the problems that we have and hopefully we do that that's like the word of god it reveals the problem that we have the light exposes evil the light draws the believing the light draws the believing and the light then the light lights the way jesus says i am the way the truth and the light. 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me, and the light lights the way. Listen, and then lastly here, the gospel light attracts some strange bugs. The gospel light attracts some strange bugs. How many are thankful that you were one of those strange bugs that the gospel light attracted, right? And uh, as a church planter, uh, having uh, seen people that will show up, you know, for uh, uh, beginning church services and things, there are some uh, strange people that are attracted and Lord willing and hopefully they get saved. And, and thankfully, uh, as one of those strange bugs, I got saved. But this morning we need to understand we are all born into sin. We've been separated from God because of that sin and being blind spiritually and unable to comprehend the things of God. Our only hope was for one to open our eyes and deliver us from that blindness. And his name is Jesus, the light of the world. We needed him. We need him. Jesus had encountered a man who needed his touch and, and used this as an opportunity to reveal that he was in fact the light of the world. Those who walk about in darkness need his touch. And this man received much more than his sight that day. All who come to Christ in salvation have been delivered from the blindness of sin. And our eyes have been opened to the blessings and benefits of being in Christ as the light of the world. As we discuss the realities within this text here, I want us to consider as uh, we break this down here just line by line, uh, verse by verse, we understand and we see here, we see Jesus as the light of the world. Jesus as the light of the world, as he declares himself to be. Notice with me, number one here, we see in this story, we see the predicament of this man. We see the predicament of this man. As we begin to examine this passage, we consider uh, this man, uh, this blind man was in a predicament. First and foremost, uh, the predicament that he was in was that he was blind. He was a blind man. How many in here have known a blind person before. Know somebody that had that, is, uh, struggles with blindness. We see in verse number one, he was a blind man. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man, listen, which was blind from his birth. As Jesus departed from the temple and those who sought to do him harm, he passed uh, by a man, the Bible says, was blind from his birth. And we don't know how old this man was necessarily, but we do know that he had dealt with blindness his entire life. He had never experienced the beauty of sight. He had never experienced the, the beauty of God's creation around him. I think about being a blind person and man, the, 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 the beauty and the splendor that we'd miss out on. But this man was in blindness, but he was also, he was in spiritual blindness as well. He had never experienced the beauty of sight, and I know no other description in the Bible that describes our situation as sinners better than the predicament in which this man found himself. He was in blindness. We're all born spiritually blind. Our eyes had not been opened to the truth of the gospel and the darkness of sin is all that we knew, all that we know and not knowing the, the beauty of God's grace and salvation, we were unable to do anything about our condition and we stood in need of one to open our eyes. We all stand in need of Jesus to open our eyes. I want to ask you this morning, have your eyes been opened? Have you gained that spiritual sight? Have you been saved? Uh, we didn't sing it this morning. I didn't realize that it was not in the uh, words of that one song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Now, at least I didn't catch it. Did anybody catch it? Uh, I once was lost, but now I found I was uh, blind, but now I see. It didn't say it in that version of the song, did it? No, but Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but... Now I see the predicament of the man was that he was blind. The second predicament was that he was a beggar. He was a beggar. In verse number 8, the Bible says, The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? 
Is this not he that sat and begged? There is a man that couldn't see, and as a result of not being able to see, he had to depend upon other people to help him uh, with certain things. And oftentimes he would beg, hey, can you help me? Can you help me do this? Can you help lead me over here? Can you help me tie my shoe? Can you help me find my food? Can you help me? I misplaced this here. Can you help guide me? He needed somebody to help him. Those who lived around him, around this man, they were familiar with him and the great predicament that he dealt with. Being blind, he was unable to provide for himself and he had to resort to and had to often depend upon the kindness of others. Respectfully but simply, he was a beggar. He was blind and he was a beggar. You know, you and I before salvation were in the same predicament. We may not like to admit it, but we are all beggars prior to salvation. Our eyes were blinded by sin and we were unable to provide for ourselves spiritually. I needed someone to tell me the good news. I needed somebody to be that tool, that light bearer and share the light of Jesus with me just like you needed somebody. Whether we knew it or not, we're beggars in need of somebody to bear the light to us. Others knew my need and others pointed me to a church. And and, uh, don't get me wrong, a church doesn't save you. But if it's a good church, it'll preach the gospel. And the gospel is what saves you. Somebody knew my need and they pointed me to a church that preached the gospel. And I went to that church and I heard the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I knew that I was a sinner in need of Jesus as my Savior. And I personally received Him as my Savior. I got saved. I got born again that day. I was simply a lost beggar in need of the light of salvation, Jesus Christ. I was one, I was a beggar uh, looking for another beggar to tell me where to get some bread. Jesus, the bread of life. Notice he was blind, his predicament here. He was a beggar, but then notice thirdly, he was also blessed. He was in fact blessed. Look at our passage here in verses number uh, one through three as uh, Jesus passed by. Look at your Bibles there. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The man was blind and he was a beggar, but he was also blessed. What do you mean, Pastor Sam, that he was blessed? It's evident to see when we consider the text here that he'd been blind from his birth. But one day, Jesus passed his way. One day, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, Jesus came his way. I believe Jesus was seeking him. I believe Jesus absolutely, as the omnipotent God, omniscient God, all-powerful, all-knowing God, knew that this man was blind from his birth and he didn't just want to save him and didn't just want to give him uh, spiritual... uh, He didn't just want to give him sight. He wanted to give him spiritual sight. And he had an encounter with the Savior. He was blessed. The Lord was well aware of this man's condition and he had compassion on him. And when the disciples wondered who had sinned, uh, the man or his parents, to cause this blindness, Jesus responded. He said, neither. The man's condition wasn't the result of his sin or his parents' sin, but that the works of God would be manifested in his life. Uh, I believe the Lord used this passage, a similar one, anyhow, that uh, when, uh, you know, we, we just had a kidney transplant happen back in November. Can you believe it's, all, it's already over, Kelly? And uh, we had a kidney transplant take place, and as the Lord's working on my heart here, and, and I was thinking about uh, the situation of Kelly seeking God's face before I, before I decided to be a donor. I, did, I never thought, I knew Kelly's a sinner. I knew the whole Van Vliet family are wicked <laughs> sinners, but... But uh, I thought about the scenario. I thought about the situation. And uh, 
I believe the Lord used this passage to speak to my heart. It wasn't that Kelly's a sinner. It wasn't that her parents are sinners. It wasn't that Don's a sinner. And although they are, don't get me wrong, they are sinners. And, and uh, they have testimonies of salvation. But it wasn't, uh, they weren't, she wasn't suffering as a result of that. The condition that she had wasn't the result of the, the sin of her parents or anything of that nature. God wanted to do something great. God wanted to be glorified in, in her life and in the situation and show a loving, caring uh, church family. And God wanted to perform a miracle. And by the grace of God, he did that. I'm thankful for the day that Jesus passed my way. I wasn't looking for him. I knew I needed to be saved. I knew I was a sinner. Thankfully, there were some kids my age. They invited me. And don't overestimate, don't underestimate uh, the importance of youth ministry. And uh, my friends invited me to an Awanas program on Thursday nights. And and they didn't tell me about all the, the Bible stuff that was a part of it. They said there were cookies and, and punch and they played games. And I um, thought, oh, man, that's cool. That appeals to my flesh. And I went and we played games and we ate cookies and I had a Kool-Aid smile and it was super fun. And, and then we had a Bible lesson I got preached to and, and I learned that I was a sinner and, and I learned that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. And then I was encouraged to receive Christ as my Savior and I received Him as the light of the world and I got saved. That day Jesus passed my way. Although I was sinful, I was loved of God. Through salvation in Him, I was given my sight and brought glory to God. I hadn't committed a particular uh, sin that many might be uh, considered wicked and heinous or gross sins, but, but I was still a sinner nonetheless. nonetheless. And if the Lord could save me, He can save anybody. And He will save anybody. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care your past. God does, and God can save you from that. God can wash that slate white as snow, and He can use you for His glory and receive glory in your life. We see, number one this morning, we see the predicament of the blind man. Man, he was a, he was a beggar, and uh, he was blind, uh, but he was blessed when he got saved, when he, when he, when he got his uh, spiritual uh, uh, sight. But secondly, this morning, we see the predicament of the blind man. Number two, we see the power of the master. We see the power of the master, probably most importantly here. In verses three through seven, we also discover the miraculous power that Jesus possessed. Now, why did Jesus possess this power? Jesus possessed this miraculous power because Jesus is God. Say amen right there. Say amen right there, Christians. Jesus is 100% man. Jesus is 100% God. He veiled His glory as God to come down to this earth. And, and he, he wore the flesh of a human, but He never sinned. He never did one thing wrong. That's why he can. That's how He can be the payment for the sins of all mankind. He was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so, in uh, this passage here, in uh, verses number uh, 3 through 4, we see His sovereignty. We see His sovereignty. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus knew that He'd come to earth with a purpose. Jesus had come to this earth not to do these miracles, not necessarily just to give this blind man sight, but He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came, that which was lost. He came to give His life a ransom for many, for all, by the way. And so, we see the power of the Master. We see His sovereignty his works of grace and power in the life of this man and others like him would reveal his deity to those he encountered. Jesus had come to reveal himself as the Christ. He came to reveal himself as the Savior of mankind. And as he offered himself the sacrificial atonement for sin, we see his sovereignty and we see his sufficiency. Look at verse number 5. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, 
I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Not I was a light, or not I was the light. He says, I am the light of the world. Jesus revealed that he was the light of the world, and he came to shine the light within the darkness of sin uh, to reveal the lost condition of men and draw them unto the light. He came to break the bondage of darkness of sin through deliverance in salvation. And he was able to bring light to this blind man. And he's able to bring light to the entire world. But he needs light bearers. He needs light bearers. I got a variety of different lights up here. And uh, actually, this is my most recent one I got out of a house. And this is a cool one, you know, different lights have different purposes, different usages or different uses, but ultimately they all are supposed to what? They're all supposed to bear light. Now this is a good one for men and boys camp out. By the way, man, I got uh, the campground reserved uh, again at the tip of canoe. We I tried calling on the one down here. My wife did actually, but we're never early and we're never right on time. I think there's a list of people that set their alarms like we do. And they call, and so, uh, but the tippet canoe will work. And so this is a good light to put on a, on a picnic table, maybe in the evening um, to, uh, as you want to have a meal or Bible study or what have you. Uh, but this will light an immediate area. You know, you know how they work. You know how lights work. I don't really got to explain too much, right? And uh, then this is another one. This is a, you know, these, these have advantages. This is, a, this is a mag light, and I love this light. I love mag lights, and it's good handy little light that you can use, and it's good and solid. You need to use it as a weapon of defense. You can do that, and you can use it as a brace, you know, if you need to punch somebody, Mrs. Bullock. <laughs> but uh, this is a nice little mag light. It's handy. And then this is a super, this is like a mag light. It's not technically mag light brand, but... But it's super powerful, and it's got different settings. Some lights, how many have a light that's got the SOS signal? But you have those? And so it's still bearing light, but it's doing it for, a, for an exact reason and purpose of sending a message. Oh, it's dead. Maybe not. It'll die here shortly. Then, this is uh, probably one of the most handy lights that I've got. How many have... Did we give he headlights out here some time ago? These are my favorites, you know. Is it working? And you can, you know, you've got your hands available. You can see if you're under a hood or underneath a vehicle. I don't like being in either of them, but uh, you, you got to do something. And uh, you need your hands free. And uh, then you can do this if you got a bad rooster, uh, peaches. This is a, this would be a good one. <laughs> uh, you got this. You got this. And uh, then this is another light here. But 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 all that to say, all of these uh, all of these light bearers have the purpose of bearing light. This was a good one, and uh, I grabbed it. I knew it wasn't going to work. I don't, I don't think it needs new batteries. I think this has new batteries, but it just fizzled out. And, and this is a nice little handy light if it works, but, but um, this, this light bearer doesn't bear any light. Don't try to blind me, Audric. And um, you know, I was thinking about this idea of bearing light. This I'm going to throw this thing away. We've got a couple of these laying around, and... And I've gone to grab, I need a light, went to grab these in the cabinet and the cupboard a couple of different times, and it never works. What are you going to do with a flashlight that never works, that never bears light? It's useless. It, it's not fulfilling its purpose. I think about that as, well, I think about us as light bearers. When we've received the light, we're to be those light bearers. And if I'm not, uh, I'm not saying Jesus is going to cast you away because you're not bearing light, but you're not as useful as you should be. You're not, you're not 
fulfilling the purpose that, one of the purposes that God created you for in bearing that light that He so generously, somebody graciously and generously pointed you to the light and you'd received Him. There are different types of light bearers, but all have the same common purpose and the same goal of revealing the light. I want to ask you this morning, are you bearing that gospel light that God designed for you to bear? Where and how are you shining in this world of darkness? The light is the gospel and the light is Jesus. Are you being a light bearer of Jesus? His power hasn't diminished over the years. His light still shines as bright and sufficient today as it did some 2,000 years ago when He came. Jesus fully satisfied the righteous demands of the Father and His sacrificial atonement uh, contributes to be, uh, continues to be sufficient to save. Jesus alone is fully sufficient to save and give you light. We see, number one, we see His sovereignty. We see His sufficiency. And then number three, we see His ability. His ability. Look at verses number six and seven. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Kind of a kind of a weird, kind of a crude way to heal somebody, right? It says that uh, when he had uh, thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now I don't I don't I don't know, I don't have much application to that other than. Jesus doesn't always do things the way we might think He needs to do things. My God can take, my God's so awesome, He can spit in the dirt and then wipe that dirt, wipe that mud on your eyeballs. And He can heal somebody. That's how awesome my God is. He doesn't need to do some fancy showboating stuff. He's awesome. But He did that. And He took and He uh, spat on the ground and... And verse number 7, And said unto him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation is sent. I find that pool named a peculiar name. After the Lord had healed him, given him his sight, uh, well, he's, after he'd washed in this pool called sent. I wonder if there's any reason why it was specifically named the pool sent and why Jesus told him to go to the pool sent. He went this way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. And Jesus had anointed the eyes of the blind man and commanded him to go and wash in the pool. And as the blind man responded in obedient faith, he received his sight. His blindness was no match for the power of Jesus. And on that day, he received his sight. And the Lord had the ability to provide. And by faith, the man received the gift of healing. And you know, a blindness, sometimes it seems impossible to cure. I don't know anybody that's ever been cured of their blindness. Maybe there have been some, but I say seems impossible here. Typically, those who are born blind never receive their sight. But what's impossible with men is possible with God. God can do anything. Don't restrict God. Don't bunch Him in your box there and, and to try to figure Him all out. If, he, he, if anybody can do anything, He can if He wants to. What's impossible with men is possible with God. He's able to deliver from the depths of sin. And, sin, and uh, there are none uh, that the Lord can't deliver he has the power to redeem the hardest sinner and to break the chains of sin so, that so long had him bound. God can do anything. What we see here, we see uh, the ability of our Savior. He can heal. But then also, we see in this passage here, He was sent to this pool called Sent. I believe there's reason to that. After he had received his uh, spiritual sight, man, now he had a message to tell. Now he had something that he could proclaim. He had something to broadcast. I don't think it was any coincidence that this pool is named Sent. By the way, if you've received your sight, you're to be sent. Right. We see here lastly, number well, number one, we see the predicament of the man. Secondly, we see the power of the master and then number three, notice lastly here, we see the profession for the master. 
We see the profession for the master. After that blind man had gotten walking around, I don't know how far the pool was from where uh, Jesus rubbed the spit on his eyes. And it doesn't say that Jesus guided him to that pool either, but he told him to go to the pool sent. So I can imagine this, this blind man with spit on his eyes walking over. Hey, can you help me? He's still a beggar. Can you help me? I need to go to the pool sent. Maybe nobody helped him. Maybe he... Maybe he just had a bearing, the bearings to be able to find that pool there. But he went to the pool and he washed in the pool sent. Now he had his sight back. Now he could see. Now he had a message to tell. Verses 8 through 11, following his healing, the blind man professed Christ before others. After he'd received his sight, he had a message to tell. After Jesus had touched him, he had a story to tell. He had a, he had a testimony of, uh, of healing in his life. When something as great as gaining spiritual sight happens in life, when Jesus saves you, you're going to want to profess it as well. We see here, we see the curiosity of the company People had taken notice of this blind man and the change that had happened in his life. They noticed that he could now see. Look at verses number 8. Verse number 8, it says, The neighbors therefore and they went before had seen him uh, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. So some were over there and they saw that this man, hey, was that, the, was that the blind man? What's he doing? It looks like he can see stuff now. And some of the guys were saying, oh, it, no, that is, looks kind of like him, looks like him. And then he professed, he said, it's me. It's me. I got my sight. I can see now. And I, see, I can see clearly now. <laughs> uh, I don't want to hear. <laughs> the rain is gone. <laughs> Um, funny, I don't know. He didn't say that necessarily, okay, but, but he says, it's me. I can see. I see things. And, and uh, therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? And so uh, the change in his life had brought about these questions. I wonder, since you've been changed, it brought about any questions. Here, I got saved when I was little. I didn't surrender to the Lord to do His will till later on in life, after junior college, after I was in my mid-twenties, I guess. And uh, How old was I when I got married? Um, and so, uh, but uh, there was a transformation that gradually had taken place and, and uh, where I had grown up and the people that knew me prior to uh, knowing that, uh, man, now in, I'm in Bible college, I'm training for the ministry to, and to serve God and he's going to be a pastor someday? You're a pastor? What in the world? <laughs> what happened? Well, I did get saved when I was little, but man, God changed me. God did something in my heart. God, uh, I'm a new creature, and I want to live for Him and serve Him. I remember my, my, so my stepdad is asking questions when he asked my brother when he learned that I was going to a college to train for ministry. What happened to Sam? <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say exactly what my brother said, but uh, he said, "Yeah, he's he's still the same in some areas, but uh, he's different in a lot of areas." But anyway, we see here we see the curiosity of the company. This company, these people that knew this blind man, they, they were curious what in the world happened to this guy. After the man was healed from his blindness, those who knew him became very curious. Some uh, thought he was that man, and others assumed it must have been someone who looked like him. Hearing their questions, the man declared that he was in fact the blind man. Those who knew him immediately noticed the change in his life and wondered how such a miracle had taken place. Listen, a life touched by Jesus Christ will reveal a change. Will reveal a change. You know, I, 
I do think, I do understand, you know, you can be saved at an early age. We can, uh, and, and that's how we ought to pray. You know, I don't think you ought to not pray that uh, somebody will not get saved when they're young at the expense of having a, uh, 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 testimony to where they, you know, fall in deep sin, and then there's a miraculous change later on in life. By any means, I don't, I don't think that, you know. But like, uh, say, uh, believe Canaan has a testimony of salvation. Canaan got saved. My boys, my three older boys, all have a profession that they'd received Christ uh, at a very young. But, uh, you know, if you've been saved later on in life, you had opportunities to get off into some bad sin. Or maybe you did get saved when you were, when you were young, but then later on in life, uh, the, the Lord brought you back. And, and uh, you, maybe you're like that, uh, that prodigal who was out in the hog pen and you came to yourself. You realize how foolish you'd been, and you realize the great plan that God has for you, and, and how many of your father's hired servants are, are, uh, are benefiting from being with the father, but you're out there eating in the hog pen. You need to come to yourself. But these men noticed that there was something different about this blind man. Jesus brings about transformation. Jesus brings about transformation. We see the curiosity of the company, and then uh, just two more here. We see the curiosity, then we see the identity. He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus. Listen, if you've been saved, if there's been a transformation in your life, it's not because you turned over a new leaf. If you're saved. It's not, oh man, you're, you just, you changed and you're working super hard now. Maybe you are, but that's not salvation. Salvation is holy by faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one that does the transformation. Right. Not you, not me, not the, well, not the 12 step, 10 step, whatever, however many steps you want to add in there. It's Jesus. Jesus does the transformation. This blind man met Jesus. It wasn't a nice doctor, wasn't a, you know, special medication. It was Jesus, the God-man. If you've been saved, it's only through Jesus, the God-man, uh, Jesus Christ. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. No man comes unto the Father but through Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. And we must receive Him. We see his identity. The man was quick to tell those who wondered about the miracle of his healing that a man named Jesus had anointed his eyes and commanded him to wash in the pool and he offered praise. He offered recognition uh, to the Lord uh, for the miracle that he had done in his life. We need to have the courage and commitment to share what the Lord's done for us. Now some may never ask you, I asked before, I don't know if it's in this congregation or not, but have you ever had anybody come up and say, what must I do to be saved? I haven't had that happen too many times in my life. Typically, it's me initiating. It's going to be you initiating. But if there's been a change, people are going to ask. And uh, so your personal testimony of salvation is the greatest evangelistic tool that you have. People are interested in your story because it gives hope for their condition. And what happened to Sam? What happened to, what happened to Brother Randall? What happened to Jacob? I remember that guy. He was a no good, low down, dirty. Drunk. But God changed him. God did a work in his heart. God saved him. He passed from death unto life. He's a new creature. He's got spiritual sight. Purpose for living. We see the profession for the master. We see the curiosity. We see the identity. And then we see the certainty. The certainty. Notice the certainty about this man's testimony. Verse number 11, and we're done here. He said, and I went and washed, and I received sight. He knew there was a change. He knew what happened in his life. He knew that he'd received the sight. 
It was undeniable that the man had received a great miracle. He'd responded in obedient faith. He did what God told him to do, and God changed him. And the Lord provided his sight. The man knew that he was able to see, and it was evident for others as well. The Lord had touched the blinded eyes of this man, and his vision was evident for all to witness. There was no way anybody could argue. There was no way anybody could deny it was his personal salvation story. He knew. How did he know? Because he was there when it happened. How do you know you got saved, Pastor Sam? Because I was there when it happened. My parents didn't trick me into it. They didn't convince me that I was saved. I got saved February 27, 1986. In the fourth grade, I was in an Awanas uh, classroom, and I heard the gospel preached, and I knew that I was a sinner on my way to hell. And an older man named John Mason took me, and he showed me John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, Sam? I almost said, Pastor Sam. Yes, I do. You believe that you're a sinner and you need to be saved. Yes, I do. Would you call on the Lord and ask Him to say, Yes, I want to. I bowed my head. I asked Jesus to be my Savior. I felt like a ton of bricks had lifted off my shoulders. My slate, I felt so good. After I got saved, man, I felt like a, felt like a new man. Why? Because I was. All the lying and cheating in school and bad stuff and being suspended and stuff. And <laughs> I was a new creature. I had a new slate. And, and then I got it dirty all over again. <laughs> oh, I eventually, yeah. But um, the certainty, I knew that I got saved. This man knew that he'd been transformed. And Here's the point. I have no doubt Jesus did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I was blinded by sin and I was unable to bring about healing. And at the moment I received salvation, my eyes were open to the grace of God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, filled my inner being. The, the earnest of the Spirit of God take, took up residence in my, in my temple, in this body of mine. I know what happened because I was there when it happened. I'm certain of my salvation and I'm secure in Jesus, my Lord. As I was there, we see the certainty of this man here. In closing, this morning, I want to ask you, where are you today spiritually? Where are you today? Have your blinded eyes been opened through the power and grace of the Lord? If you've never responded in repentance and faith and salvation, if you've never received Jesus Christ, today's the day of salvation. Would you like to receive Him? Somebody can show you from God's Word. One of our men can show a man from God's Word how you can be saved, how you can call on the Lord and know that you have spiritual sight. If you're a lady, one of our ladies would be happy to show you from God's Word. Be happy to show you after church. I urge you, if you've never done so, to come to Christ and receive the light that only He can provide. Apart from Him, you'll continue to wander in darkness separated from God in sin, I want to encourage you to receive your sight today. Christian, if you are saved, rejoice in what the Lord has done for you and commit to proclaiming His grace every opportunity uh, that you get. Be that light bearer I don't think this will blind anybody. Be that light bearer that God desires for you to be. Our world is filled with those who desperately need the light of Jesus. Let's be light bearers for him. Let's bow. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for being that light, the light of the world. You desire to light up the hearts of those that are in spiritual darkness, those that have been blinded by sin. You desire to save them and be the light of their life. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd uh, help us if uh, we have received you as the light. I pray that we'd be the light bearers that you desire for us to be. How do we be light bearers? We share the gospel. We be a witness for you. We tell others about you. We share the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. We tell our story. Lord, I pray that you work in hearts this morning. May we be light bearers for you. 
with heads bowed and eyes closed and nobody looking around this morning. We come to our time of invitation. In just a moment, our piano will play, pianists will play, and we'll have an opportunity to respond to uh, the message of the Bible here this morning. And we've seen Jesus, the light of the world. He desires to open our eyes from spiritual darkness and give us sight. I wonder this morning, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you personally received him? You know for sure that if you died, that heaven would be your home. You have a Bible reason for professing that. How many here would say, Pastor Sam, I do know that I'm saved. I do know that I've received my spiritual sight. Jesus has saved me. Would you slip your hand up if that's your testimony this morning? You have received Christ. Man, you may put your hands down. Many hands were up. Not every hand was up. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning and, and you're uncertain about your eternal destination, would you talk to me afterwards? Would you say, would you just come up to me after the service and, Pastor Sam, I'd like to talk to you about salvation. I'd like to talk to you about heaven. Easy as that. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Maybe here this morning and uh, the Lord spoke to your heart about being a light bearer, being more of a light bearer. God spoke to your heart, and that's you. Would you slip your hand up about being a light bearer? God spoke to your heart about being a light bearer for him, about bearing that light. My hand's up. Should all want to be better light bearers. Well, let's all stand this morning as the piano plays, and if God spoke in your heart, would you come do business with him? Would you come take a knee, perhaps? Or maybe you have a loved one that needs to be saved, and you want to pray for the salvation of that loved one, or you know somebody that needs to be saved, needs salvation, needs the light, and you want to pray that God would help you to be the light bearer to them.